Hi, um, last time I talked about how to get an LED to flash like this on board a Raspberry Pi Pico and the C++ or C code we need to do that. Um, this time I just want to talk about the project structure and control files, those CMake files that we use to actually build the, file, the code. Um, it's really important to understand how that structure works and how we are then going to change it or influence it in order to actually build our own programs in the future. So this video is really going to drill into that subject. Um, let me know what you think. Uh, let me know what questions you have in the comments, please. And please like and subscribe because that helps me keep me going with these videos. All the code I'm going to talk about is actually on GitHub and published and you can go and use it. It's in my project RPI Pico Basics. I taught last time in the first of this series on um, basic use of the Pico and C and C++ um, about how to clone and copy down that code. Go and look at that video and that will remind you of those steps. And of course the steps of how to actually build this code to actually get your running uh, Pico project and copy it onto your Pico. If you're new to all of this, I do have a course that explains how to set up the toolchain and build the Raspberry Pi Pico over on the Udemy platform. Uh, I'll put the link in the description. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. PCBWay helps me out with production of PCBs. They strive to be the most professional PCB manufacturer for prototyping and low volume production work in the world. Quick turns around on PCBs from their own in-house production. They can also assemble the PCBs and help with project hardware through 3D printing, CNC machining, sheet metal work or injection moulding. PCB Way can really support any maker project. So the project is really just a folder and all of the structure is based around that folder and that top level folder. In the example I'm talking about it was um, the one Pico Flash. But you could have any name there, that's the folder that contains all of your files. The most important folder in there probably is the source folder, SRC. That's where we're going to put all of our C code that we're developing. But it isn't the only folder. And it's around these two folders that really a lot of the control files are exist to actually help us build. That top level um, folder structure uh, contains some really co important control files to help us build. You remember when we're going through the build process, we issue the command cmake dot dot. Well, to, that first kicks off by loading the cmake list dot txt file in that project folder. And that really defines the whole of the build process. And it does it by including some other files into it. One of those files it includes is that pico sdk import file. And that's really quite key because that's what gets us to all the definitions we need from the Pico SDK to be able to actually build the Pico application. That top level make file is also going to import uh, the source folder and tell the compiler where the, all the source code is. And down there is another cmakelists.txt file. This one's there to tell the toolchain where all the source files are located and what libraries to link those source files with. As well as the source folder, we also have the build folder. And we've seen the build folder last time. It's where I build all of my binaries. So the actual code that I'm going to copy over onto the Pico, be that the UF2 file for boot select or the L file for SWD, single wild debug. The build folder also contains a lot of intermediate files from the build. Um, sometimes things go nastily wrong when you're setting up projects and um, you can get the build process state into a little bit of a, a problem. So the nice thing is we can always delete the build folder, recreate it and go through the, the cmake dot dot process um, onwards again and we build that all back up again. So it's, um, it's a nice disposable folder. And in fact, I never put my build folder within GitHub. So um, that's always something that is only produced for the local copy that I'm building from. The build folder then has a source folder inside it, which mirrors uh, the source folder 
that we've just been talking about with our C code in it, but this one's got all of the binary versions, the compiled versions of those files. So not in the basic project we looked at last time, but in a bigger project, we will probably also have a lib folder. And the lib folder will contain various libraries that we're pulling into the project. For each of the libraries, I commonly write a CMake import file and I place that up in my project folder so that I've got all of the libraries and all of the code to import and get those libraries up and running and part of my tool chain. Some complex libraries, um, things like when we start playing with real-time operating systems, with IP stacks, um, we have to actually do some configuration of those libraries or almost port them over to our platform. So I often have therefore a port folder which contains a mirror of the library folder in terms of uh, folders within it. And in there I'm going to put code um, to help me actually configure those libraries to run successfully on the Pico and successfully on the Pico within my project. And the final folder I often have in a project structure is a test folder and that contains code that I'm going to use to build unit tests. So I'm an agile developer or I was trained as an agile developer. So I believe in doing test driven development. So I really want to write a whole set of unit tests to test all my code and to make sure that everything works properly before writing my entire application and bringing it all together. Now that might be a bit um, simplistic for a flash code that's just going to flash the LED and indeed that's why there aren't any test code for that. But for more pro complex applications I frequently write tests. I've got some videos on my use of CPPU test um, that I use as my test framework so you can go and have a look at that on YouTube. All of these folders um, the libraries, the port folders, the test often have CMake list.txt file or some sort of CMake import file in them to help the process build them. But those aren't the ones we're going to focus on today. Today I want to focus on the make files at the project level and the make files within the source folder. So here in Visual Studio, I've got the code for our project and we can see these make files. So let's start with the make file at the project level top level. Now the first thing that uh, is in here to really worry about is the name of the project. Now you could just put the name everywhere you want in, the, in these files, um, but I find it great to actually define it as a variable called name. Um, that way I don't misspell it, do uh, strange capitalization of it in different places, and find lots of problems with the build process. So that's the way I, I name everything. I put that name there. And you'll see it then referenced uh, lots of times by this dollar uh, squiggly brackets name throughout the folder. So then we're going to include the uh, Pico SDK import file. So that's giving us all of the utilities for building Picos and cross compiling them because you know uh, we have to tell the compiler and the tool chain that we're not actually running and trying to build things for our local computer, we're actually cross compiling it for a completely different architecture to run on the Pico. Um, we're going to set up uh, some definitions of the standards and the types of files we're going to compile uh, there, and then we initialize the Pico SDK. So that sets up everything. So everything is now ready and it understands we're going to be cross compiling for the Pico. And we add a source folder. So that's where we tell it all our source code and there's another CMake file, list file in that folder source. And there is a bit of code here um, that I added myself so that I can actually type make install and get it to flash directly to the Pico. That's not necessarily the standard, but um, that's really useful. It just runs a little utility I've got on my system. Um, and there is a bit of release code management here to actually convert the else binary that is normally built into a UF2. So the UF2 file is needed for boots select process, and that's an additional step that has to be done in order to convert that over. But that's it. So really, you know, 
generally to change your programs and do things, the only real line of code you're going to change in this is the name. Um, when you get a little bit more advanced, we start putting in the includes for the different uh, libraries in here. But um, that's really all that is at the top level. It's generally fairly um, boilerplate, i.e. standard. And we just add a little bit and tweak a little bit to this file. Let's have a look at the one in the source folder. So the job of this one in the source folder really is to uh, explain to the build process what are the C and C++ or assembly, if you're doing P um, PIO development, code that you're going to run on your the Pico. So the first thing we're going to do is, is add an executable. You see we've got the dollar name again here um, and we're just going to tell it that for this example, my flashing LED, the only file I'm including is the main.c file. For some applications, this might have 20 files in here that are all going to get built in to uh, convert and to run over as a single binary on the Pico. Now, all Pico's uh, applications link in some libraries. Even the very simplest needs the Pico standard library. And um, that's what we're doing here. So we're telling it that for our, our um, binary our, that we're building, our dollar name, we need one library at least, which is the Pico standard library. We might want to link a whole set of them. This link libraries bit is quite important because it actually has two effects. Not only does it cause at the end of the build process it to link those libraries in, but actually it also triggers uh, the inclusion of the include path for those libraries so that your code actually compiles as well. So um, this is often an area where I forget to add in the library and the compiler sort of fails. So one to be aware of. And there's a final step here around adding some extra outputs um, to give you some additional um, output types available, which is in the standard build can't say that I've ever really drilled into what it does or worried about it. Um, I've just left it there um, and copy it into each one of my projects. Um, something I must look at, but um, yeah, the bits to worry about, the bits you're going to have to change are up here to add in uh, your new programs or what, what a code you're adding when you're um, spreading your programs across uh, multiple C and C++ files. And indeed, your libraries when you're linking in additional libraries. I haven't seen many people go through and talk about all of these different project structures and how that all holds together to actually build your Pico application. So I thought this was quite a useful video to put out there. Certainly one I would have quite liked to have looked through when I first started using the Pico way back when it was released. Um, I hope you found it useful. Please do leave me some comments and let me know what you think. Um, I really do appreciate that. Uh, of course, please like the video and please subscribe so that you keep um, being notified of uh, new videos from me. Thank you very much and see you soon.